Death on Demand is coming to Canada, but what will it take for all Canadians to be able to die well? That's next. Our first two guests hold different views on medical aid in dying or doctor-assisted suicide. Andre Picard reports on health care policy for the Globe and Mail each week. And Professor Ian Gentles is the co-author of a new book, It Isn't That Simple, Euthanasia and Assisted Suicide Today. Thanks both for being here. Thank you. Okay, Andre, let's start with you because we've been on different sides of this. I think this is alarming for uh, Canada. You think this is a great move for patient right. Why? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's great, but I would say it's necessary. So a very small percentage of patients will have intolerable pain. We won't be able to, to you know, help them. And they will choose to die, to have a hastened death. They're going to die anyhow. This is not killing them. It's just hastening their death. But we've already had patients who do not have pain who have asked to have it happen. Gillian Bennett, NBC, fearing dementia might come knocking. Well, this is what we don't want. We don't want people just doing it on their own freelance. We want a set of rules and regulations. Uh, it's not clear that someone like Gillian Bennett would be accepted under this program. The reality is a lot of people now do kill themselves. Uh, you know, they're for various reasons, some because they're in intolerable pain. Uh, I often uh, refer to the case of a couple in Toronto. They were elderly, both very ill, jumped from their balcony. Yeah. That's not a humane death. Uh, in their case, maybe assisted death would be better. It would be at least more humane. But Ian, how, how do you feel about the government's decision to legalize euthanasia? Well, it wasn't the government. It was it's the true. Supreme Court. Supreme Court, which, that's right. Which said that the criminal code prohibition on assisted suicide is unconstitutional. In fact, Parliament several times over the last 20 years has voted very clearly uh, against legalizing assisted suicide or euthanasia. And the Supreme Court, despite saying that it owed high deference to Parliament, completely ignored and overrode Parliament's clearly expressed wish. So your caution is what? what what's your concern? My caution is that Granted, a small minority of people may want to have assisted suicide, but in contrast to that, we have a large number of people who will now be more vulnerable than before. And all the research shows that when people, when it becomes legal, people increasingly resort to it, not because they want to express their autonomy and, and end their lives quickly, it's because they're submitting to pressure. They're saying, I don't want to be a burden. And less and less are they protected against outside pressures from their family, from the medical profession, or just the general perception in society that they're a nuisance and they're costing too much, and it would be better if they stepped out of the way. Okay, we haven't got a lot of evidence yet in Canada of that. Let's, let's just stay a moment here on the pressures. Okay, so let's go to another study, the Canadian Medical Association poll. Andre, you've written about this recently. Less than a third of our doctors want to be responsible for administering it. So we've got 70% of Canadian mm -hmm. doctors saying, I don't want to be engaged in euthanasia. What do they know that we should be looking out for? Well, I think uh, they know the same as us, but they, their whole uh, way of being trained is to help people, and it's natural. Uh, most people, most doctors don't want to be involved in this. Most people don't want to be involved. This is a last resort for a very small minority. Again, the reality is a very small number of doctors will be carrying out this procedure for a very small number of patients. I think we have to keep it in perspective. Of course, most doctors don't want to do this. Most doctors don't do a whole bunch of stuff. Let, let's, let's take a real life example here. Someone we've mm -hmm. interviewed here at Context. This is um, Maureen Taylor and her late husband, Dr. Donald Lowe. Listen to their plea. I'm just frustrated not being able to have control of my own life, not being able to make the decision for myself when enough is enough. And I really envy countries like Switzerland and the Netherlands and the United States where this is possible. I mean, why, why make people suffer for no reason when there's an alternative? I just don't understand it. 
And everything he predicted about how awful it would be, I mean, except for the pain, thank goodness he never had pain, but the rest of it did sort of play out the way he worried it would. Okay, hey, uh, Ian, let's go to you. That is the reality. And that was a game changer, Dr. Lowe's suffering. That's the reality, but I would uh, point out two things. First of all, the Supreme Court, prior to this decision, had, had decided in the Sue Rodriguez case that heart-wrenching though her plea was, the public safety had a higher claim, and that's why they refused to change the law or to rule that it was unconstitutional. I would also refer to the experience of the Netherlands. The latest report on the Dutch experience is that over 500 people a year are put to death without their knowledge or consent. This is where physician-assisted dying has got us in Holland. A large number of people being put to death without their knowledge or consent. Why is this happening? Well, apparently because the doctors think they know best. And that's a real danger. Okay, Andre, anything that we can do to increase care for that kind of risk, against that kind of risk? Well, again, we have to really invest in palliative care. That's important. And again, I have to stress this is a small minority. I, I, don't, ever th I don't think we'll ever have laws as liberal as Holland or Belgium. I think there's no question some of their cases have gone overboard. Uh, our protections are much greater. If you read our Supreme Court judgment, why did they change a little bit from Sue Rodriguez to the Carter case? Because society changed. Society is way ahead of Parliament, and it was also the Supreme Court judgment was largely about equality. Uh, people with disabilities were denied the same rights of people without disabilities because they couldn't physically take their own lives. That was the basis of that case. We Consider now, that. We now have access to hastened death coming faster than access to pain management. Something and the is solution, wrong with this The solution picture. to that is better pain management. It's not to deny people who can't control their pain the right to end it. Uh, we've had, we have assisted death in Quebec. It's been going on for two months now. There have been several cases. The world didn't stop turning. Everyone did it uh, willingly. It was done humanely. Uh, and it's working. And it's a very small number and it'll continue to The Quebec to be. law, in fact, is modeled exactly on the law in Belgium, which is very liberal and very permissive. And in Belgium, for example, people are being put to death because they are suffering from depression. Depression, as we know, is a treatable condition and it has its ups and downs and somebody may want to kill themselves today and tomorrow have completely changed their mind. But in Belgium, if you get the right doctor to sign the certificate, you can be dispatched just like that. But that and that's what we're facing yeah. in Canada because Quebec has already pioneered the way. That absolutely can't help happen in Quebec. Under Quebec's law, you have to have a terminal illness, which is even more restrictive than the Supreme Court ruling. So Quebec has probably the most restrictive assisted death law in the world right now. It does not. Okay. Absolutely does. We are going to continue that discussion uh, there's great material you both left us, links we have on you online on these differing stacks. Mm -hmm. But Andre Picard, health policy columnist for The Globe and Mail, and Ian Gentles, the author of It Isn't That Simple, Euthanasia and Assisted Suicide Today. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sheldon, you have some fast facts for us. That's right, Lorna. It's clear that a large majority of Canadians support doctor-assisted suicide. An Ipsos Reid poll from 2014 found that more than 80% of Canadians support a right to die under certain circumstances. Now, the most recent stats on putting this into practice come from Belgium, and they suggest caution. A 2015 study in the New England Journal of Medicine reports how doctors in one year hasten the death of over 1,000 patients without their consent. Multiple studies have also concluded that depression can play a major role in patients requesting to die. Well, in one study, depressed patients were four times more likely to have a high desire for hasten death compared with non-depressed patients. Now, these facts suggest that moving forward, the key words will be scrutiny and safeguards. The quality palliative care is something that is not available to all Canadians, sadly. Um, it seems that only a minority, according to some figures, anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of patients um, and families may have access to quality end-of-life care. But we also know that quality end-of-life care is not just about managing physical distress, 
but being attentive to psychological, existential, and spiritual dimensions of distress. Well, Sheldon, that is uh, one of Canada's top palliative care doctors, Harvey Chachanoff, mm -hmm. uh, on the need to expand access to end-of-life care. So, like, my generation is very concerned about that when we hear, like, only 30% of Canadians can get mm -hmm. access to pain management. Does that register in your generation with as much alarm as it does in mine. Well, I'll put it this way. There's a popular phrase that says, out of sight, out of mind. And I think for a lot of people, um, I'm about, I'm 29 years old. I think a lot of people in our age group, when we wake up, look in the mirror, we don't see the quote unquote signs that the end is near, so to speak. So, <laughs> As um, if I do. Well, now, now, what I say mean by that is for many, when they don't think about it, they say, oh, it's something that is an issue until suddenly that becomes something that's present in their lives and all these things that we're diving into this show becomes elements of concern. Wow. Uh, but I think a pro proper care is something that all ages uh, should be um, concerned about and should be addressing. Okay, and because you're going to help your grandparents through this yes. journey. And yeah. then your parents. Yeah, and then, right. okay, yeah. so let's carry the conversation further. We have got two great experts from Winnipeg, Shelley yeah. Corey, the Executive Director of Virtual Hospice, right. and Dr. Denise Marshall from McMaster University here on set, who has been uh, renowned for her work with palliative care, both an academic and a practitioner in this. Uh, welcome to Context, both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dr. Marsh, I want to start uh, with you. Um, for those who are not necessarily accustomed, and this theme is something that is foreign to them in terms of palliative care, uh, what difference can it make as we enter the final stages of life? But first, take us through a beginner's primer on palliative care. Sure. Well, palliative care is both a philosophy of care and a skill set. And our definition that we've coined in Canada, as posted on the Canadian Hospice Pad of Care Association website, so you can read it later, is excellent. It's the best in the world. And it explains to us that palliative care is about surrounding people in their care circles with active and compassionate therapies that attend to what I heard you saying, mind, body, and soul, mm -hmm. physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological needs of any kind. In any care setting, at any age, with any illness, for anyone facing a life-threatening illness, and it's designed in a way to be sensitive to one's cultural, one's familial uh, needs, um, one's ethnicity. So it's a highly customized philosophy and skill set. So that's palliative care in a nutshell. Okay, and how accessible can this become? We've mm -hmm. heard that only 30% get it. I gather the virtual hospice center wants to see a big change in that. Yes, Lorna. Um, Virtual Hospice is the most comprehensive website in palliative and end-of-life care, loss and grief in the world. Um, but more than that, what we are is a safe place for anybody with internet access to find trusted information and support without judgment from a healthcare team and people who have walked that road themselves. Okay, so for both of you, this conversation is in the backdrop of Canada's new pending legislation on euthanasia. And that's happening because Canadians are afraid they will suffer or they will be treated beyond their wishes. What difference, Denise, does good palliative care make? It makes all the difference. I mean, it's very clear you live longer and you live better mm -hmm. uh, with good palliative care supports. And that's both professional, you know, formal and informal supports. Um, we know that when people receive palliative care, they're less likely to um, feel that they will accept physician hasten death, even if they've um, agreed to, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so we know that the jurisdictions that have it. Palliative care is, is a game changer. And, you know, and everyone can co-locate on the idea that most human beings want to be in the business of relieving suffering, suffering of others. So the difference between speculating or worrying or actually experiencing suffering is the difference between having this comprehensive embracing of palliative care and good end-of-life care or not. And it's not, uh, we're all worried about the expense. We only have so many health care dollars. Mm -hmm. But patients, you're, you've been mm -hmm. with cancer care so much, it is, they're winding up in our acute wards 
anyway. It's palliative cheaper care, to spend it at palliative. Palliative care is the most efficient health dollars we'll ever spend. There's tons of data that show that's extrapolated over Canada or provinces looking at the hundreds of millions of dollars that would be saved the health care system if we had truly integrated palliative care. I mean uh, a whole community engagement approach with health care people and community members together figuring out who will do what. So it's an incredibly, meets all of Health Canada's aims. People like it, it's good value for the money, and it's sustainable. So it's it's an incredible be the cost saving as well. And Dr. Marsh, you're, you're, I'm going to follow up on that. Now that the court has ruled that we have a right to die, what else? If we were to if we were to say from this day forth, fix this, fix that, what would those clear points be? Well, we need a comprehensive national and provincial and territorial strategies for palliative care. I mean, the time is nigh. We'll never have this kind of legislation arriving in our country again for the first time. And it will, it's focusing on end-of-life care. It's an end-of-life care discussion. There will never be a better time for us to say palliative care is a public health issue. It is everyone's business. It needs to be a core service everywhere all the time. So each province, each territory, at the federal government level, within planning districts and communities, palliative care has to be embedded as like just the basic foundation of how we give care and figure out what that means. We will never have this opportunity in Canada again. Okay, so that's at the national level. Uh, and Shelley from Virtual Hospice, how do I use your site? My mom is sick, how do I, how do, I do it? You come on to virtualhospice.ca and you can, uh, you can surf through information, you can find articles and videos, you can ask our healthcare team questions, you can go on to our discussion forums. Um, there are just beautifully rich discussions and support happening on our discussion forums. Um, and we've got two new tools that we've just launched that we're very excited about. One is called mygrief.ca and it helps people move through their grief experience. And the other is livingmyculture.ca. And we have um, videotaped people from 10 different ethnocultural groups and they've shared their stories about living with advanced illness, loss and grief. And we just have some absolutely beautiful wow. stories to share with people that are that can empower people within those communities and are really rich, educative tools for healthcare providers as well to ensure that people are receiving that quality end of life care at end of life. Well, thank you. And we'll, um, I'm gonna link, I have a story also from Manitoba that is my sister-in-law going through her palliative experience. So we'll put that up there with your links as well. Yes, thank you so much for both for joining us. Um, Shelly, uh, actually from Winnipeg rather, Shelly Corey with Virtual Hospice and Dr. Thank Denise Marshall here in studio, palliative care physician and researcher from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks so much. Coming up, the art of dying, how we can find the spiritual strength to rest in peace. When we or our loved ones are dying, we need comfort that goes beyond words or good wishes. Our next guest knows a lot about that. Rob Mould is the author of The Art of Dying. He is an award-winning journalist and former hospice volunteer. He joins us today from Seattle. Welcome. Hey, Thank you. Rob, I loved your book, and I loved that you opened with the example of your aunt dying, and you were kind of awkward about it, and you thought, this is, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. Tell us about how that started you unpacking. How are you going to uh, work with the idea of dying family? Well, I was, you know, standing literally at my aunt's deathbed. We called her Aunt Buzzy. That's the name we, uh, the nickname we had for her. And I'd been visiting her apartment for years uh, since I was a child. And. You can imagine it, it was it was incredibly awkward for me uh, to have been away uh, off at college and uh, working, and then coming home and my mom says, you know, your aunt is dying. You should go visit her. Uh, it was awkward. It was uh, maybe more than awkward. I was very uncomfortable and not sure what to do as I'm standing at my aunt's deathbed. Uh, but it it was uh, it proved to be a gift to me because I had to learn. When you can show up and be present uh, with somebody in a time of pain or a time of suffering like that, 
uh, that in itself is a gift. We don't always have to fix things. We don't always have to take a specific action to make things better. We can offer the gift of our presence, and that in itself is valuable. Uh, Rob, you say we're not getting enough spiritual counsel about how to die. And, and I want to know, what does that look like? What are we missing? And, and we have a young audience here. What does that look like when you're offering spiritual counsel on something like this to younger audiences who may be saying, oh, this is, this is far down the road. I don't need to be concerned about that now. I have a full life to live. Uh, it's really easy today to uh, go through life and to never experience death to never have to confront these issues and, and then end up at some point, uh, at some point down the road uh, without any resources, without any idea of how to confront these issues, without any, uh, without any help in dealing with what will be a difficult process and something that we're all going to face. Okay, Rob, and so, I, can I just interject there for a moment? Because I, what yeah. I love about this is it is your dying aunt who has, thinks she has nothing left to contribute. And look, here we are, these mm -hmm. years later, still talking about the gift of someone's gentle death, natural death, that it gave to you, her nephew, now to others as you teach on. What, what are you teaching now about what Jesus offers us at the end of life? You know, there's, uh, my, my aunt, as I, as I was visiting her, she had, she had a hospice nurse in her room and uh, very little else. Uh, she had a dresser and on her dresser, she, had, she was Catholic and she had pictures of the saints, uh, pictures of uh, Pope John Paul. And she was drawing on her own spiritual resources. And that, that's, a, that's an incredibly long Christian tradition. Uh, John Wes Wesley, the, um, the 17th century preacher, would ask people on their deathbed, do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus? And that harkens back to John chapter 14, in which Jesus said uh, that where I go, I I'm preparing a place for you, and I will come and bring you to myself. And uh, that, that hope of Jesus coming to us uh, to welcome us into the next life, that's an incredible hope. The, the Christian hope that, that all of the suffering that we go through will eventually be redeemed, that it will, that it's not the end, that there is joy and a, a, a hopeful future, especially in Jesus' presence. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a hope that, uh, that we can cling to. And why is it holy work? You, you describe it as holy work. We used to have a, an incredible tradition of telling stories of people's, uh, people's final moments, uh, people's deathbed wishes, people's uh, end-of-life conversations. Uh, we don't do that anymore, uh, but I think that that's something that we miss because those are holy moments. Those are spiritual experiences uh, that only come about in, those, in that moment when, uh, when there is uh, that liminal presence between this world and the next. All right. Thank you, Rob Mall. Rob Mall is the author of The Art of Dying, and he joined us from Seattle, Washington. Fascinating, Sheldon. Yeah, in depth. Lot to think about there. Yeah. Um, well, death is difficult to talk about, as we've seen here, and but as we've heard, it's good to bring our fears out of the dark and into the light. So my question for you at home is this: What does dying with dignity mean to you? What makes a good death? Give us your thoughts by any of the means you see on the screen. You can contact us by phone at 1-800-215-4913, by email at comments at contextwithlorna.com, and on Twitter, Facebook, at Context TV. Coming up, my thoughts on Apple founder Steve Jobs' epiphany at the end of his life. For Margaret, God's plan mm. is that her frozen life gives life to others. Ben reads from Mark's iPad. Ben and my kids' love for me help me face tomorrow. And I mean, uh, I know or we know that it's uncertain. And I guess we talk, like to say, to say uh, we and the kids don't have fears. Uh, you know, that would be really, you know, wouldn't be right. We do, but uh, right now we love each other and put our trust in the God who has made us and promise to be with us. And I guess that's, I think you said that's, 
you've always said that's what keeps you you know going is that is that trust and that hope No surprise to regular viewers here, but I love stories. And one of them has been the biography of Apple founder Steve Jobs, who said, I'm about 50-50 on this God thing. I'm just not sure. Steve Jobs' sister told the press Steve's last words. She said, Steve looked over her shoulder and went, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. What did our Apple genius see on his dying horizon? In all our talk about the right to request a hastened death through new legislation, let's spend a moment on what comes next, heaven. A sixth century bishop, St. Isaac the Syrian advised, prepare your heart for your departure. If you are wise, you will expect it every hour. And when the time of departure comes, go joyfully to meet it, saying, come in peace. I knew you would come and I have not neglected anything that could help me on the journey. We all have a choice to make. Will we be a follower of Jesus in this life and at death? It's both intellectual work and spiritual work to process that question. So there's much more information on that when you go to our website, click on the resource feature by this episode. I've written an essay on this there myself. And drop us a line with your questions on dying or faith with God. We do our best to answer all our mail and get you onto the discussion about Jesus and heaven that you will need to prepare for dying. So for all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. more news for you online at Context. Now these are the stories you won't find or see on TV, but it's a daily delivery for your phone, iPad, or computer. Here's a few of them. The Good Book calls to care for the orphan, the widow, and foreigner, and the poor in our homes. So what is a faith-based response to those struggling through the child welfare system? Hear from the founder of Safe Families Canada. Well, with the rush to respond to the refugee crisis, we've seen a lot of challenges in welcoming refugees. We talked to Johnny Moore, author of Defying ISIS, who says that our compassion for refugees needs to be intelligent. Well, there's no denying it. The political conversation had quite the spotlight on business tycoon Donald Trump. Does he really have the support of American evangelicals? Well, Lorna and producer Stephen Lazarus write for the Globe and Mail. My friends, you can find all of that and so much more online at contextwithlorna.com.